Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, obviously, in this series on Bible poetry, we're looking at Job, uh, how he was coping with suffering. Now, the story of Job is itself a drama in poetic style. It has a prologue and an epilogue. The, uh, the uh, epilogue is in prose, and the prologue is as well. But how did Job cope with suffering? Well, for most of the story, not very well at all. Uh, and we read of the Apostles' uh, take on the subject. Well, that's not so unlike ourselves when difficulty arises in our own lives. When we, we say to ourselves and to anyone who will hear, well, why me? What have I done to deserve this situation? Some perhaps, sometimes perhaps going so far as to say, why does God allow suffering? Well, hopefully we'll see a little of that in the experiences of Job. So Job's story is in a sense an enacted parable. The Lord Jesus Christ uses parables and so the whole process and the journey of Job is in its way an enacted parable. And so we're introduced to this man uh, who, was born, uh, uh, who was born in the land of Oz, a man who was blameless and upright, who feared God and shunned evil. And there he had uh, several sons and uh, three daughters and was quite rich as you can see on the screen and he is said in scripture to be the greatest man uh, of the people of the east at the time now despite, despite catastrophes happening to him that overnight he lost his, his, the, his children and his flocks in all this we're told that Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing and Job is being tested further when we picture him sitting there amongst the ashes scraping his sores with a pot shirt. And Job was on a spiritual journey. And the realisation that no man can be justified in his own right and that he had to realise that he was flesh and blood subject to death at the end of his life. And the point of this enacted parable is to make us all realise that not one of us can earn salvation by the things that we do. The salvation that God has promised to call us out of death was the case, which was the case of course with the Lord Jesus Christ. He was pulled out of death, out uh, of death by resurrection. What must I do to inherit eternal life? The young man said to Jesus. Perhaps he sh should have said, what must I become or what must I be to inherit eternal life? The Philippian jailer said something similar. What must I do to be saved? But he did take the right course of action. But Job was a great doer of good works. And he seems that he relied upon these good works to justify himself before man and also before God and through his experience we without the trauma that be, was the experience of Job can learn what the Apostle Paul tells us writing to the Ephesians for it is by grace that we can be saved through faith and not from yourselves it is the gift of God not by works so that no man can boast. And here we're introduced to Abraham, who was also patriarch uh, of these early times. And it says that, well, he could boast about his works, but not before God. And then it was written down that it, all he did was to believe, believe what God promised, believe what God said to him, and it was credited to him uh, as righteousness, as we know from other parts of Scripture. So we've got there uh, introduced a sad picture of human suffering. And Job, well his wife, Job's wife said to him, Are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. And he, 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 he tells her off as it were, uh, that you know, it's not, not for you to say such things. And yet he was convinced of his own innocence 
and even in the end complaining to God himself and such a, cha a challenge even in this parable could not go unaddressed well Job's experience really is a spiritual journey if we were to read the 42 chapters of the book of Job and because it's quite a long book we might so easily take against Job like his friends did were it not for the comment in the New Testament that we have here in James brothers an example of patience in the face of suffering take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as you know we consider blessed those who have persevered and Job in particular is of course mentioned now when we read a book we really, really read it from the beginning to end but in a sense the most important part of <coughs> the story of Job is there at the end and we shall read the end that uh, God uh, decreed for him uh, later on so you see that there's a definite point to the story of Job a story that would have been assuredly of great help to the Lord Jesus Christ in his particular sufferings now we're very familiar with the common phrase Job's comforters and uh, uh, we're introduced to these three men so called friends but they, were, they, they came to him to uh, sympathise with him and uh, when they saw him of course we're told that he, uh, they wept aloud and sprinkled dust on their heads as uh, is the tendency in the east and so it, they sat on the ground for seven days and seven nights saying not a word now after that period of seven days and seven nights Job cursed the very day that he was born emphasising that view with all sorts of other poetical expressions and then we think about these three friends when they did speak it was to accuse him uh, as if the judgments had come upon him simply because he'd done something wrong and to give an example we got Eliphaz consider now who being innocent as have perished where were the upright ever destroyed as I have observed those who plough evil and those who sow trouble reap it well that's a little bit below the belt but he wasn't alone Bildad said something similar when your children sin, sinned against God and don't forget they were destroyed he gave them over to the penalty of a sin well it's more or less pointed the finger saying well, well what about you then Azophar if you have put away the sin that is in your hand and allow no evil to dwell in your tent and the implication of that is also very very clear so he's saying why why me says Job he's even complaining against God the arrows of the almighty are in, are in me my spirit drinks in their poison God's terrors are marshalled against me uh, and he said teach me he says to his friends be quiet show me where I have been wrong and there's irony in that he's challenging his friends to say well if you can find fault in me well put me right but even in that Job was really in essence justifying himself and so you've got these expressions of his, his physical condition my body is clothed with worms and scabs and so on and my days are swifter than a shuttle remember remember O oh God that my life is but a breath my eye will never see happiness again or as another translation puts it mine eye shall no more see good never again to see good which is not of course to be the case and it's not the case for the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ <coughs> but in this morbid state of mind he seeks justice telling his friends I will maintain my righteousness and I will never let it go my conscience will not, not reproach me as long as I live these are the words of Job 
I don't deserve it, is what he's saying. I will say to God, and he's sort of practicing the sort of things he might say to God, do not, do, do not condemn me, but tell me what, what, what I've done wrong. Though you know that I am not guilty and that no one can rescue me from your hand, I become a laughingstock to my friends, though I call upon God and he answereth, a mere laughingstock through righteous, though I am righteous and I am blameless. He pre now he says that I have prepared my case I know I will be vindicated and there's arrogance in those last few words <coughs> and in that standpoint and yet he says though he slay me my hope is in him uh, and you see that Job is a little bit mixed up here there is a, another prophet who says that virtually that if all his, his world falls apart yet he was still trusting God and that is Habakkuk and so he says in his terms which was his world though the fig tree fails the crops the olives the grapes uh, and so on and there's no sheep in the pen no cattle in the stalls if all my world has fallen apart yet will I rejoice and be joyful in God my saviour but as we see Job in his self righteousness is considering that in that stance he can still approach God well that cannot really be the case so what about Job's observation on life why do the wicked he says live on growing old and increasing in power and nothing ever happens to them uh, their, their children establish them around their, their offspring before their eyes they spend their years in prosperity and go down to the grave in peace yet they say to God leave us alone we have no desire to be involved in your ways who is the almighty that we should serve him what would we gain by praying uh, for to him the kid would say well I'm doing very nicely thank you and Job's analysis may have been expressed and perhaps even we ourselves had wondered at that sort of situation for it does seem that the wicked have an easy life but those who are followers of God of course are tested with, uh, with the things that we're going to be talking about. King David, the second king of Israel even pondered over the issue until he was reminded that the wicked have no future. Not in God's terms. Job at his end is to have a future although at this time Job is expressing his desire for a vindicator who will prove him innocent there and then nevertheless he expresses this truth when he says if only you would hide me in the grave and conceal me till your anger has passed if only you would let me set me a time and then remember me if a man dies will he live again all the days of my hard service I will wait for my renewal to come however it must be said in those very words that Joseph, Joshua's sorry jo, Job's objective is still that his innocence will be upheld and he sees it being maybe beyond the grave to be justified and this same sort of motives carries the words of Job through to something that is of course mentioned in Handel's Messiah and we're very familiar with these words uh, oh that my words were recorded that they were written on the stroke he wants everyone to know that he is innocent I know that my Redeemer lives and he's hoping still that the Redeemer will be there to vindicate him and then after my skins have been destroyed yet in my flesh I will see God I myself see him with my own eyes and not another how my heart yearns of course for him now Job looks back at his former standing and when I went to the gate of the city I took my seat in the public square he tells us about the young men 
and the old men setting aside. The chief men refrained from speaking, covering their mouths with their hands. Something, of course, that Job was later to do in his conversation with the Lord Almighty himself in this parable. However, uh, the voices of the nobles were hushed and their tongues stuck to the roof of their mouths. Whoever heard me spoke well of me and those who saw me commended me. But how the mighty have fallen. But there is a purpose in Job's suffering. And yet Job counts up all his goods, good works as if to say that was what was a God wanting of him. And so these men had uh, been respectful to him because, because I delivered the poor and cried in the fatherless. Uh, the blessing of him was ready to perish. I got involved there. I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My judgment was as a robe and a diadem. I was the eyes to the blind, feet to the lame. I was a father to the poor and the cause which I knew not I searched out. And so these three men his so called friends were told stop answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes they themselves were not in the right either for Job, Job remarked uh, men at ease have contempt for misfortune at the fate of those whose feet are slipping in other words it's always easier for us to point the finger at others when for our, our world if you like when we are doing well ourselves it's easy to do that looking at others misfortunes when we're in a good position ourselves now another observer comes into this story of uh, Job and it's Elihu in a sense he's speaking for God and we're told that he's very angry with Job for justifying himself rather than God he was angry with the three friends because they found no way to refute Job and yet had condemned him not guilty as seemingly charged and in this particular chapter Job chapter 31 there's lots of ifs if I have raised my hand against the fatherless knowing that I had influence in the court then let my then that true justification do judgment come upon me let my arm fall from the shoulder let it be broken off at the point at the joint if I have devoured <coughs> the yield of my land without payment or broken the spirit of its tenants then let briars come instead of wheat and weeds instead of barley and so we're told that the words of Job are ended. He can't say any more. And to each of these ifs in this chapter, and we're just quoting two of them if you like, mentally he would be saying, not guilty, not guilty. So there's a sense of arrogance, of self righteousness, by which, of course, we ourselves can always deceive ourselves. We can always justify ourselves for any actions that we take easily. So Job could say no more. He still was not vindicated as he wanted. Job's experience is, is telling us something like a parable that the Lord Jesus Christ uh, expressed. And of course it's the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. Two men went into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself, or with himself, as some other uh, translations have it. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. And we're going to tell us that in the context of this uh, parable, I tell you, said Jesus, that the publican rather than the other went home justified before God. And he makes a statement which is a, a scriptural fact. That everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. 
and he who humbles himself will be exalted and Job was eventually to come to that frame of mind but we learn as the tax collector stood at a distance he would not even look up to heaven but beat his breast and said God have mercy on me a sinner and Job was to come to that sort of situation and so Eli uh, challenges Job but the greatest challenge was to come from God himself and that is when Job's transition from a self-righteous man into one who was truly humble before his God began so Job is confronted with God then the Lord answered Job out of the storm who is this who darkens my counsel with words without knowledge brace yourself like a man I will question you and you shall answer me and what was the response of Job and Job answered the Lord I am unworthy how can I reply to you I put my hand over my mouth which is exactly what uh, the expression he referred to the, to, to the uh, chiefs and the chieftains etc that they put their hand over the mouth uh, and said nothing out of deference to the presence of course of Job and here Job is doing exactly the same thing out of deference for the uh, almighty I spoke once but I have no answer twice but I will say no more then God goes on in this in this uh, enacted parable to state his preeminence in particular to his creation and his creative power asking were you there did you know and so again he says brace yourself like a man I will question you and you shall answer me <coughs> and so God through his demonstration of his omnipotence in these closing chapters of Job uh, brings Job finally through the veil of suffering to a greater realisation of God and for Job to acknowledge God's righteousness and that Job had done no righteousness of his own then Job replied to the Lord I know that can, you can do all things. No plan of yours is to be thwarted. You ask, who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, I will speak, I will question you, and you shall answer me. And this is what he says, that my ears have heard of you, but my eyes now have seen you in a sense it become to full spiritual maturity through this transition that had taken place through his spiritual journey it come to this my eyes have heard of you but now my <coughs> eyes have seen you therefore he humbles himself I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes well that's where he'd been sitting hadn't he on dust and ashes but that's what he actually says so Job was now certainly a different man than he was at the beginning of this story he'd been through great tribulation God, God brings him as James tells us to a better frame of mind and with a, a bless, blessing greater than before I'd like to open your Bibles though at Job chapter 42 where we shall look at the final end of Job the position and the point to where God brings him it's Job chapter 42 and we're going at verse 12 so the Lord blessed the latter end the end of Job more than his beginning for he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 she asses. He also had seven sons and three daughters. 
whether the catastrophe concerning these uh, sons and daughters had not actually taken place and they were restored to him, I don't know. But he called the name of the first Jemima, and the name of the second Kezia, and the name of the third Keren Hapko. And in all these things there was no women found so fair as the daughters of Job, and their father gave them inheritance amongst uh, their uh, brethren. After this lived Job an hundred and forty years, and saw his sons, and his sons' sons, even four generations. So Job died, being old and full of days. So Job's parable, a story, is a parable also for us. In essence, it's got elements that can touch and concern our own individual lives. For we can be affected by material, material or physical losses. We can be affected by uh, difficulties with friends and family. It can happen. And we certainly are affected by the battle with our own nature. Job had to battle with his own nature. So did the Apostle Paul. He tells us, For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Though, of course, his delight is in the law of God after the inward man. And so this is, in a sense, the philosophy uh, of life through experience, that tough times don't last. It didn't last for Job, but tough people do. And so the Apostle James summarizes that journey, that, that process, when he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials and tribulations of course of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete not lacking anything and it starts of course with repentance having a new mindset to the things of God's future so there is a value of discipline in our life even the management uh, individuals come up with these sort of things of discipline this, the one thing necessary to achieve any goal worth having and our fathers disciplined us says Paul writing to the Hebrews for a little while as they thought best but God disciplines us for our own good that we may share in his holiness no discipline seems pleasant at the time but it's painful Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So, all these things, as it was for Job, character building. Hardships, we're told by C.S. Lewis, often prepare ordinary people for a de uh, an extraordinary destiny. But even if you should suffer, says the Apostle Peter, for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear do not be frightened it is better he says uh, to suffer for doing good than for evil for Christ died for sins once for all the righteous for the unrighteous to bring to you to God he was put to death in the body but made alive through the spirit when we think of the Lord Jesus Christ that he suffered more in fact than Job we're told that uh, Jesus during the days of uh, his life on earth he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who would save him out of death. It wasn't easy for the Lord Jesus Christ. He suffered. There's no doubt about it. He would take such uh, help and assistance from the story uh, of Job. And he was hurt in that he uh, was uh, uh, because of his reverent submission and was brought to life again through the resurrection there we have a picture if you like of the empty tomb the most important tomb in archaeological history had nothing in it not like the tomb of Tutankhamun which was full of treasures etc the most important tomb that ever been is the tomb that where the Lord Jesus Christ uh, resurrected from 
Job's suffering and his perseverance has a serious point. It helped Jesus to endure. It can help our perspective to know that it is the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. Oh yes, Jesus suffered more than any man. For in as much as he was himself felt the pain of temptation and trial, says Weymouth, he also is able instantly to help those who are tempted and tried. It's empathy. There's a world of difference between empathy and sympathy. And although he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. And that's the same sort of situation that can apply to us. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. But we shouldn't leave things there. We should look to the Lord Jesus Christ. And there we have very important words from Isaiah. Talking of the, the sufferings that were to come <coughs> upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, these words are mentioned, of course, in the uh, Messiah. And Job's experience was that, and this particular passage here from Isaiah was obviously mentioned, I would suggest, uh, when the Lord Jesus Christ, after his resurrection, was talking to these two on the road to Emmaus. And Jesus said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets were spoken. Did not Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? So there's a wonderful, there was a wonderful end to the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. His latter end was certainly better than his beginning. Born in a stable. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them that what was said in all the scriptures concerning him. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but he's done that once, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So that our end may be much better than our beginning. And so we should be looking to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us fix our eyes upon him, because he is the author and finisher of our faith as the or authorised version has it consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that uh, you will not grow weary and lose heart if any of us is suffering in any way don't lose heart Colossians chapter 1 tells us God has chosen to make known amongst the Gentiles the glorious riches of the mystery of the inclusion of the Gentiles into God's future kingdom here on earth which is Christ in you the hope of glory faith in what things that God has prepared for those who love him and his son to become part of the glory that is the Lord Jesus Christ so like Job our end can be so much better than our beginning if we look to the Lord Jesus Christ and all that he stands for looking to the promise of eternal life in God's kingdom here upon the earth when to quote again from the, the prophet Habakkuk that time when the earth will be full of the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea